Good morning, everyone. Uh, we're glad you could join us uh, today for our virtual research seminar series. Uh, today we'll be talking about the USC COVID-19 biorepository. Uh, my name is Camilo Ansara. I'm Associate Director of Business Development and Industry Relations at the MASH Academy, CAC School of Medicine. And uh, for those of you who are not familiar with the MASH Academy, our mission is to empower the convergence of research disciplines to address challenges in human health and disease. And we are here um, as a dedicated team to help facilitate connections and collaborations across USC with the Keck School of Medicine, we, uh, with other researchers as well as externally with industry. And today we're very excited to be able to bring um, this seminar to you. But uh, before we start, uh, there are a few housekeeping items I'd like to discuss. Uh, we have three presentations today, three very exciting presentations and a single Q&A session at the end after the presentation. And for the questions and answer uh, session, I would like to ask that you please use uh, the raise your hand function on your Zoom screen. When you do so, uh, I'll be able to call on you and uh, allow you to speak and then you'll be able to address the speakers directly and ask your questions. Uh, if you prefer, you may also use the Q&A tool uh, to write in the question, but we do encourage you, and I will give priority to those who use the raise your hand function in your Zoom, uh, just because you'll be able to ask the question directly to the speaker, and the context of the question is, uh, is, is always better understood. So, and finally, I wanted to let you know that this webinar is being recorded. Both the slides and a recording of the presentation will be available on the MASH website uh, within a few days. Um, okay, so um, let's get the presentation started. Um, as mentioned, uh, we have three amazing speakers today, and it's now my honor to introduce our first, our first speaker, Dr. April Armstrong. Uh, Dr. Armstrong is uh, Associate Dean of Clinical Research at CAC School of Medicine at USC. She also serves as Director of Clinical Research for the Southern California Clinical and Translational Research Institute. Uh, in the Department of Dermatology at USC, she serves as a Vice Chair, uh, Director of Clinical Trials and Outcomes Research, and Director of Psoriasis Program. Dr. Armstrong's presentation today is entitled COVID-19 Clinical Research at USC, Clinical Trials and Biorepository. So please welcome Dr. April Armstrong. Great. Thank you so much, Camilo, for the introduction. And I am going to go ahead and share my slides with the audience. So first of all, I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, I am very excited to be here to talk to you about our USC COVID-19 biorepository. And joining me today, as Camilo has said, um, is uh, Dr. Dean Wallace, Professor of Pathology, and also uh, Mr. Neil Barus, who is our Chief Research uh, Information Officer. So when we think about the USC Bow Repository, I want to tell you a little bit about its history and the funding source. This is an effort that is supported by the Keck Foundation. And the Bow Repository collects blood, saliva, urine, uh, and or tissue samples from patients who have confirmed positivity for COVID-19. Uh, the rationale for creating the bio repository is so that we have a central place where we can really with blood specimens tissue specimens to really help to understand the natural history disease progression as well as possibly treatment responses in our patients with COVID-19. So it is really a systematic effort to ensure that we can learn from our patients with COVID um, as much as possible uh, within our local community. The samples from control patients are also collected such that we can compare um, that from our uh, patients who had been uh, infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus from those of control patients. It is important to know that uh, the clinical information is linked to the biospecimens, and that way we can, uh, we can have the understanding of demographic information as well as their clinical progression um, through the EMR data that we, that we have. And the specimens are banked for future research. Um, here are some of our uh, 
team members who have worked uh, on the biorepository since the beginning. Uh, it really does take a village to uh, run the biorepository. And I really wanna thank the efforts of our, our team members, both, both in the implementation of collection of the specimens and also importantly uh, for the processing of the specimens. And lastly, uh, in terms of the efforts to really make sure our data uh, are all uh, linked and uh, uh, ready and available for our investigators uh, to do research. So let me talk about the three main cohorts from which we collect the bio specimens for the COVID repository. First, we collect uh, samples from patients with severe COVID-19. And these are the patients who are hospitalized in the Keck Hospital, as well as our county LAC plus USC Medical Center. And the reason for the collection of this cohort is that we wanted to ensure that we have a spectrum of disease severities that are represented in the bowel repository. And this is the first cohort actually uh, logistically that we started to collect sample from. We are also uh, uh, be, uh, starting and have started to collect samples with patients uh, who had mild COVID-19. So these are the patients who have come through our screening facilities who have been tested to be positive uh, to have uh, the SARS-CoV-2 virus. And then they are, uh, but they're not hospitalized. So they're not severe enough to be hospitalized. We contact those patients who had recently been tested uh, to be positive uh, and then uh, ask them if they were willing to contribute to the biorepository. And that is a cohort that we are growing. And uh, the third cohort is a cohort that we are uh, about to start the effort on is patients who have been considered to be recovered from COVID-19. So those are the patients who have had no COVID-19 infection, who then have completely recovered from the condition, and we wanted to get biospecimens from, from them. And this effort is done in collaboration with our CHLA COVID uh, convalescent plasma donation center, such that our patients have the opportunity to potentially contribute both to our biorepository as well as to the convalescent plasma donation center. Um, so here is an overview of the, the different samples that we collect from our patients. And these include plasma, serum, we extract DNA and RNA, saliva and urine. So these are the standardized set of samples that we collect from each patient. If they happen to have pathological tissues, uh, CSF or BALL samples, uh, our IRB is approved to collect uh, those as well from these patients. And we're currently working on the processes for these latter optional uh, uh, specimens. Um, I won't go into detail on this one because Dr. Wallace will talk uh, in detail a little bit about the, the more details about the specific samples, other than saying that for the inpatients, uh, typically we do serial collections following uh, for them, whereas for the outpatients, we do a one-time uh, collection of the samples. So here's a picture of the Keck tent for outpatient collection. Um, so if you're ever wondering where we are collecting samples from our uh, mild uh, symptom cohort, uh, being mild, mainly outpatient, that they have not been hospitalized. They, they may be more severe than that, but the non-hospitalized cohort, um, the patients can actually drive and park right there. And then they uh, go into this, uh, this tent area, uh, which is temperature controlled and also pressure controlled. And we have our uh, staff then um, collect biospecimens uh, from them in this tent. And I just want, want to acknowledge uh, here are uh, two of our phlebotomists who have been working really hard to collect samples and they, they're the people at the front line um, uh, interacting with our patients um, and we really thank them for their efforts. So as of August 7th, um, 2020, we have over 130 participants with samples in the bio repository. And um, because of our current um, uh, uh, status in, in our county, and we, we have um, uh, an increase in our, in our infections, we are focusing our effort on for uh, collecting COVID positive patients at this time. So if you see an imbalance of the 
um, the COVID positive versus the controls is because we are preferentially focusing our efforts on the COVID positive patients at this time uh, to ensure that, that we, we uh, take the opportunity to capture that population. And so we have um, of the 131, 99 of them are COVID positive. And as you can see, 32 is COVID negative. And from our patients, here is a snapshot of the available biospecimen uh, aliquots as of uh, the end of July. Um, as you can see, we have now uh, built a, uh, a good uh, collection of, uh, of the different biospecimens. Uh, each specimen is aliquoted into different amounts here, and uh, they are available for, uh, for research. I wanna talk a little bit about the hospitalized cohorts and the number of collections that we have. So in case you may have a question on, for the hospitalized patients, I know you're doing serial collections. Tell me a little bit about the number of patients that may have had one sample versus um, more than that. So let me walk you through this particular graph. So here again, we're talking about hospitalized cohorts from, uh, from Keck as well as from County. And over here, we have patients uh, with one collection overall, so 33, thir about 32 percent. And the patients with two to three time point collections um, uh, in this column, 42 percent. And then the patients with greater than four collections, four or more uh, collections, is about 36 percent. And then we stratify them uh, into the COVID positive hospitalized patients versus uh, the control patients. Um, that are uh, located down here. Um, as you can see here, there's for the COVID positives, there's about an equal distribution in patients who have had one collection time point, uh, those who have two to three collection time points, and then finally those who have had um, four or more collection time points. This is our um, biorepository oversight committee. So the responsibility of the committee is such that uh, we decide the, uh, the workflow as well as um, how we make decisions when the requests come in for the use of the biorepository. Uh, now that we have these samples available, we're currently working out the, uh, the different work processes and the steps that investigators can take in order to take advantage of this uh, precious uh, and resource that we, that we have. And we've recently also created a website where you can go and uh, obtain more information about the biorepository. And I have uh, included, so this is the page of the website. And it, you, when you scroll down, you can find information, uh, general information about the number of specimens. Uh, they're typically uh, uh, updated uh, weekly, the, the number of patients that have contributed to the to these uh, collections, and as well as how you can uh, request uh, for access to these biospecimens. Um, again, some of the uh, application process uh, mechanism are still being uh, worked out, but we do have a, a person that you can contact uh, to find out more information and then to ask about how you can access the biorepository. Again, here is the uh, website uh, for the biorepository and uh, um, you can find more information and contact us uh, with regards to accessing the biospecimens. So with that, I want to thank you for your attention and I'll give the floor back to Camilo. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Armstrong. So um, up next, uh, we have Dr. Dean Wallace. Dr. Dean Wallace is a professor in the Department of Pathology. Uh, he joined Keck School of Medicine recently in September of 2019. And prior to that, Professor Wallace worked at UCLA, um, I believe since 2000. Uh, Professor Wallace's areas of clinical service include pulmonary and renal pathology, and he has strong research interests in pathology informatics and digital pathology. Professor Wallace's presentation today is entitled The COVID-19 Repository of USC. Zuka Laboratory. So please welcome Professor Wallace. Well, thank you very much, uh, Camilla. And I, I want to say, uh, I do have other ties. I, I noticed um, all the pictures that you guys have put up of me. I, have the, I think the same tie and the same shirt. And if I'd known that, I would have put on a different tie today. All right. 
Um, let me share screen. Okay, so, um, so, so thank you, April, and thank you, Camilla. As was mentioned, um, I'm a renal, a pulmonary and renal pathologist. Now, briefly talk about the Zilka laboratory space for the biorepository. Um, so, the laboratory is is actually located in the fifth floor of the um, Zilka Neurogenetic Institute. It has a total space of approximately 850 square feet, so it's quite large. It's a BSL-2 uh, plus grade laboratory and has sufficient space and equipment for routine um, whole blood processing, um, plasma serum and other fluids, including storage of various frozen tissue specimens in multiple freezers. Other activities that we'll be um, uh, performing in the space include pathology slide scanning and adequate clean office space for staff and faculty to perform quantitative image analysis for researchers. And actually we're already seeing some studies that will use um, tissue image analysis to evaluate changes related to COVID. Um, here's a laboratory team that's currently reviewing the protocol, the handling protocol and processing of inputting the data and, and registering specimens into the database. Um, the team collectively um, has a significant long-term institutional laboratory experience um, in collecting and processing of various specimens for clinical and translational research. Um, you might notice actually, if you recognize where they're at, they're actually currently working in clinical lab space in Norris, and they'll be transferring their operations when the Zilka lab, which is what I'll be talking about, which I, what I am talking about, goes live, which we're anticipating will be during the week of August 24th. So just around the corner, um, we'll be transferring all of the operations for the processing and handling uh, into the Zilka laboratory. Um, this is the sampling protocol that April um, briefly showed earlier. You can see it includes a substantial amount of material collected over many days. Um, each of the samples are processed into multiple aliquots and stored per an optimized handling protocol that was developed in conjunction with the USC laboratory leadership, including Dr. Max Marin and Dr. Sue Ellen Martin. Um, and Dr. Martin, I, I have to, I have to um, point out, really, uh, her leadership was really instrumental in getting this laboratory set up, and we're very grateful for her input. But as you can see from the sampling protocol, uh, it's collected over many days. Um, um, not every patient uh, is able to donate every single day, and we are very, very um, careful about the amount of blood that we were requesting from the patients in the sampling protocol. And if they're um, Hemoglobin is under uh, uh, a certain level. I think it's eight, uh, eight and a half uh, milligrams. Um, we won't collect that particular day, but but um, April can speak to that. So <clears throat> this is the uh, um, very simplified processing protocol of those specimens as as they are received in the laboratory. Um, as you may have seen, we received some material in a CPT sodium citrate tube, and that's broken down into two components, into PBMCs and plasma. And depending on the amount of blood that we're able to collect from the patients really determines how much or how many aliquots we're able to store for each, for each patient and how many cells are available will determine how many uh, PBMC aliquots we can create. And they're stored, as, as April said, um, at five times 10 to the six uh, cells per milliliter. Um, the, uh, the DNA is collected in two milliliter EDT, EDTA tubes, and they are separated into, into two one milliliter cryogenic vials and stored at minus 80. The plasma and serum are stored in 0 0.2 milliliter liter, <coughs> excuse me, aliquots. Um, and again, depending on the amount of material we're able to collect, we'll determine how many aliquots we can create. Um, the PAX gene too for RNA is stored at minus 180. Uh, sorry, is stored at minus 80 uh, as is. We don't we don't aliquot that material. And the saliva and urine again are are stored depending on the amount of material we receive. We also collect MP swab material or, or remnant MP swab material, and those are stored in 100 microliter aliquots, depending on the volume we're able to collect. That's stored in liquid nitrogen. That's currently stored in the molecular laboratory. But when we go live at Zilka, that will be uh, moved to the Zilka laboratory. Um, here is uh, one of our, our research technicians, Magali Castellum. And you can see uh, Magali working in a biosafety cabinet. 
uh, really, really top priority in, in the laboratory is the safety of the personnel and, and the processes, processes that we are doing. So we have two fully enabled biosafety cabinets for handling of the specimens appropriately. Uh, and of course, we have protocols in place for decontamination of surfaces before and after each work session. All handling of biohazardous materials is transferred in and out of the cabinet in leak-proof containers that, of course, tightly sealed and sprayed with 70% um, alcohol. So um, appropriate and safe handling of the material is very, very important and is paramount in everything that we do. Um, this is actually a biosafety cabinet in Norris, but um, here you can see the, uh, the room, which is to the side of the laboratory. Um, that contains the um, uh, or it contains one of the centrifuges and the biosafety cabinets across from it. Um, as you can see, there's plenty of space for all the appropriate uh, equipment and plenty of space for all the processes to be handled uh, safely. And of course, there's plenty of space for um, additional uh, expansion. This is a centrifuge, which is, as you know, uh, the workhorse of many lab processing uh, protocols from plasma to PBMC isolation. Um, and you can see here that the uh, buckets are covered with these uh, safety caps, which are maintained to the, uh, on the buckets as they're transferred to the biosafety um, cabinets. Um, and that prevents any spills, of course, or aerosolization of materials. Um, we also have uh, four uh, freezers. Three of them are at minus 80. And you can see on the right the number of open spaces for, for aliquot. So we have tens of thousands of specimens uh, or spaces available for specimens. And as, as April showed, we've, we're al we've already collected over a thousand specimens and we have room for many, many thousands of more. And we also have a, a minus 180 or liquid nitrogen freezer for some specimens. Um, and then uh, the database that we're using to organize all of the material, which I won't talk about because Neil will be talking about this next, is open specimen. Um, just very, very briefly, this is a very functional and a very effective database system that allows us to, uh, in a very workflow friendly manner, organize, store, and, and track all the specimens that come into and are distributed from the laboratory. And also uh, um, links to important patient and specimen data. Again, I'll leave that to Neil to, to discuss more. And as I mentioned uh, briefly, um, we'll also be doing digital pathology um, work in the laboratory. And we have a couple of instruments. We have a, a, a nano zoomer or Hamamatsu nano zoomer, which can scan um, uh, slides and whole slide, whole mount slides. And um, that's paired with VisioFarm um, image analysis platform, which is a top of the range um, high tech uh, image analysis system that our uh, trained technicians and staff and faculty will work on. And then just, I wanted to call out the laboratory leadership to thank them for their, their efforts and acknowledge their efforts. Dr. Maximo Marin, who um, <clears throat> was in some of the previous pictures. He's the Clinical Pathology Research Service Director and um, the various technicians who work with him. Uh, um, I work with April as a co-PI to the, to the biorepository. Susan McCarthy is the Chief Administrative Officer who you may work with uh, on the laboratory side to help with some of the paperwork. And very importantly, Henry O'Dell was the laboratory supervisor who really did an enormous amount of work in getting the lab set up and all the equipment properly ready. And that's what I have. So thank you. Uh, Professor Wallace. Um, so now um, our final speaker is going to be Mr. Neil Barus. Uh, Mr. Barus earned a BS with honors in human biology and an MS in computer science and software engineering from the University of Toronto. Uh, he also holds an MBA in data analytics from Purdue University in West Lafayette, Indiana. And uh, Mr. Barus is the chief research information officer at CAC School of Medicine. Um, Mr. Barus' uh, presentation today is entitled Op Open Specimen Biobanking LMS. So please welcome Mr. Baruz. Hello, everybody. I'm just going to share my screen. Right. And oh, wrong screen. Hold on a second. One second. Do share screen again. And screen two, perfect. Okay. Great. Can you guys all see my screen? Yes. 
Great. So I'm talking about open specimen, which uh, Dean alluded to. Um, so when we were embarking on this project, one of the things that we wanted to make sure that we had was um, a um, state-of-the-art uh, information management system for this effort. And uh, while we were uh, trying to figure that out, we evaluated um, a whole uh, set of different um, software available uh, that allowed it, uh, us to kind of uh, be able to track our specimens and inventory them all the way through the, uh, the workflow lifecycle. And uh, the one we ended up choosing was open specimen. So open specimen is a biobanking platform that collects, um, that allows you to collect, store, process, annotate, and distribute biospecimens in a cohesive biobanking database. And it pretty much addresses um, kind of the workflow from collection to um, to being able to share those specimens uh, with individuals seeking to, to, to use them for their research. And so when we uh, looked at uh, the other uh, different platforms, open specimen kind of by, and, uh, by far was um, ahead of the game in terms of the technological um, hooks and processes it, it, it had. And I'll describe those a little bit more in detail, but basically, um, it also was a modern um, web interface, which would be accessible, which would allow us to access the data and the platform from various different sites. And as you heard throughout the presentation, um, we're currently at uh, Norris, we're moving to Zilka. We have partners at CHLA and other places. And obviously our researchers um, want to be able to access some of this from uh, wherever possible. So those are considerations as part of the evaluation. Um, and um, when, uh, when we did our review, we were obviously have selected open specimen, um, happened to be in very good company uh, with other um, academic medical centers. So um, Hopkins, Oxford, Stanford, Columbia, University of Chicago, um, and a few others also have deployed um, uh, open specimen um, for quite a while now. Um, and in fact, some of these also, uh, as highlighted here, uh, have been using open specimen as part of their COVID initiatives uh, for specimen collection. Um, Cornell, Cambridge, Columbia, Melbourne, and Davis. So I know this is a little bit small, but um, the open spec, I just want to describe this um, in more of a cartoon fashion for you guys to just understand how this information management system captures the data along the workflow. Uh, obviously, the, the COVID-19 workflow is much more complicated, uh, and April can speak to that, and she spoke to it a little bit already. Um, but in terms of the lab laboratory information management system, um, basically, participant information uh, at, from the consent to demographic or particulars of the, of the patient or subject um, are all collected in, um, at various stages in the workflow. Uh, demographic and clinical um, Information can also be housed uh, right there along with the specimen um, that is uh, received and information and metadata around that. Um, the specimen um, inventory, which is a bit, very big part of this, we wanna make sure that uh, there are no mistakes and the system allows us to be able to track pretty much the chain of custody of the specimen and all the way to the hierarchy of aliquoting and other processing throughout the workflow. And at every instance, when, when you, you, know, you, uh, you uh, take the specimen in and out of the freezer or, or do some processes with it, you're able to, bank, uh, to, to uh, not only bank the specimen, but bank the information associated with the specimen um, into the management system. And so all derivatives and aliquots are also logged. And that way it gives us a continuous inventory, but also um, the lineage of that sample is stored all the way directly connecting to the clinical information of the patient. Um, and then any annotations or any notes can also be stored there. And then um, a, um, you know, a marketplace uh, can be built off of this to allow researchers to request specimens. Uh, and then um, this also allows for uh, extensive querying and reporting and then matching uh, the specimen from the request and then potentially delivering that to um, uh, the researcher in need of those. Uh, obviously, that's governed by the Oversight Committee, which uh, uh, April alluded to, 
but in terms of the, the data collection management and the um, request management that can all be performed um, via this platform. So um, there's quite a bit of features that we have in this and, and I'm just kind of putting this out there um, because this allow, uh, adds on to the capability of our laboratory. Um, so we can do you know, planned protocols or even unplanned impromptu things uh, with open specimen. And before going to all the features, one thing that we kept in mind I wanted to share with you was um, that when we, when we put this um, system in place that this uh, be an enterprise biobanking information system that we use beyond the COVID protocol. So, so the way we have been implementing this uh, platform is that it's gonna be our enterprise solution for biobanking at USC Keck, uh, which will allow us to not only do the COVID protocol, but any other protocols. And in fact, um, uh, we're going to be um, working heavily with the cancer center as well to migrate their protocols into open specimen um, and any, any prospective protocols as well. You know, they can be built right into, uh, into the uh, part of this uh, system. And so with that, uh, the features that, that, that stand out obviously the being able to do these kind of planned or unplanned uh, biospecimen collections, obviously storage and inventory man uh, management that I already uh, talked about. And it has all the security features, which obviously uh, when we have identified patients linked to da uh, data linked to specimens is very important. The role-based user authentication author uh, authorization, um, uh, specimen requests can be done in a de-identified way. Um, there's real-time notifications um, if we need them can be part of this uh, system. Um, shipment management can also be something this can be expanded to. It obviously can do a lot of different reporting that I talked about, uh, along with schedule reporting. And uh, we have plans to uh, kind of automate some of that uh, as we go forward. Um, the key feature is the ability to be able to do custom fields and forms. So what that means is that with any sample or any aliquot or even any derivative, we can um, add to that whatever data we would like. Uh, and it's very flexible to, in order to do that. And as we build that out, it kind of creates a template for, for other uh, things uh, that we would like to do as well. Uh, for HIPAA, it has a complete audit trail, which obviously your compliance people are very happy with. So who access what data when um, is all, of, all uh, logged. Um, since we're gonna be doing migration, and that was one of the features we wanted to make sure was to be able to um, uh, bulk upload uh, data into open specimen. And then um, obviously very important in the lab is label generation and printing and being able to just scan barcodes to ease the workflow. Um, and then the ability to query the data uh, for either the technicians and operators, as well as, like I said, for the requester. And one big key feature um, was integration. And um, so some of you may or may not be aware that we use REDCap here at USC for a lot of our um, research electronic data capture and open specimen has the ability to integrate directly with REDCap, um, as well as Cerner, um, which I didn't mention. But so those are uh, those are things that we're going to be leveraging in the near future. Um, this is something we don't have to pay too much attention to, but for the for the people who care about security, um, we're implementing open specimen here on um, in our data center at USC CAC and following all the security uh, you know, uh, requirements that are, that are, um, that are expected. Um, and so this is gonna, this open specimen fits really well in order to be able to not only have the connectivity to REDCap and to Cerner, but yet kind of uh, uh, work in a, in, um, and be deployed in a very uh, secure environment. Um, I already talked about the security standards, so I, I won't um, uh, belabor this. But the main things are that um, um, the system fits in seamlessly with the authentication uh, protocols that we have, and it follows what's it called? Um, uh, what's it called? All the uh, HIPAA requirements, um, and we're going to continue. A um, the vendor is going to continue to work with us to make sure that we have the most timely updates as necessary. And the only requirement for our users is going to be that they have current HIPAA and human subject certifications, as would be required for any. Um, human subject protocol. So here, um, before I end the presentation, I wanted to share with you, um, this is probably my last slide, is what our future plans are. So our future plans are to make this data 
um, not only the COVID-19 protocol, but tomorrow as we have any other bio uh, repository protocols available to make this widely available to our researcher community to be able to search um, within, uh, within I2B2 um, a cohort that, and then to see if that cohort has samples. So for those of you who are not familiar with I2B2, probably requires a full presentation of itself. But I2B2 is a cohort discovery system that, um, that allows you to um, specify in Boolean logic a, um, uh, a eligibility criteria, a search criteria to find a cohort. Um, and it uses a series of ontologies um, uh, or dictionary terms to be able to build your query. So for example, if you're, if you're looking for um, a specific population, you can um, specify an age range, um, a, a race ethnicity field, the demographic, a specific diagnosis in this case would be COVID-19. Um, and then you can tack onto that query, um, you know, if, the, if, that, if there's um, samples available from that cohort. And what we've done in kind of in, um, um, in the short term that uh, we hope to have uh, in a few months is to be able to add this, this ontology that you're seeing on the screen um, as part of um, the query tool in I2B2. So what that means is they'll be able to drag and drop um, either a folder like the one you see right here, uh, COVID-19 biorepository specimens. And that will basically let the uh, person doing the search know that, hey, let's say if they're searching for um, subjects who are between the ages of 18 and 35, um, let's say of uh, um, uh, Hispanic or African-American descent um, with certain other comorbidities or complications. Um, and they also want to um, see if they have, um, they've been diag uh, diagnosed with COVID-19 and potentially they have a sample available in the bank. They could just drag and drop that first, fold of the second folder here called COVID-19 biospecimens. And that would give them a feasibility count very quickly um, telling them how many patients have samples. And, um, you know, obviously there can be much more uh, deeper ontology created for biospecimens, but just for the sake of keeping it simple, um, you know, um, and this kind of follows the collection that we've done. Um, um, and this is, again, um, just, just, a, just a screenshot of a mock-up of what we're planning. But basically, if, if there is a further um, granularity needed in terms of the type of samples available, um, they would be able to add that to their query as well. Um, so that's basically what our plans, future plans are once we have open specimen um, the implementation completely completed. Um, this would then allow us to integrate which I2B2, which is our data warehouse tool, query tool, um, and integrate that with um, the potential samples available in, um, uh, uh, in the biorepository. And then again, with uh, IRB approval and working with the um, Clinical Research Informatics Core at the CTSI, uh, you know, um, researchers are, can obtain more data that may not be available in open specimen from the data warehouse to complement, um, you know, um, the full spectrum of data that they have with, along with the sample uh, and the clinical data stored in the electronic medical record. So with that, um, I will conclude and hand it over back to Camillo and to uh, be able to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Baruz. Um, we are, um, we have about 20 minutes for, for questions. So, um, and um, again, if anyone has a question, uh, we encourage you to use the raise your hand function. Uh, it is uh, easier to uh, convey your message. Um, if you're not comfortable and you want to type it in, I'm happy to read the, uh, the questions for you. So we're going to prioritize the, the raise your hand uh, questions. So um, we have a question from Sinya. Um, we, can you please unmute yourself? Hi, this is Uttam Sinha from Head and Neck. I had a question for uh, Dr. Armstrong. I saw... Um, a large portion of the patients had uh, two or three, uh, our collection of specimen two, three time interval. What are those time intervals? Yeah, um, thank you so much for that question. So we are, so for the hospitalized patients, um, 
the the for the first week that they're admitted, uh, the collection frequency is day one, three, and five. Um, and then after that, for week two, uh, it's day eight, 10, and 13. Um, and then we do a, a one week three, and then week four, if they're still in the hospital and the post recovery. So essentially, it's um, three times per week for the first two weeks. And, um, and then how much we collect really uh, depends on uh, two factors. Number one is how long they stay in the hospital. And then number two is that we do not draw for patients who have uh, hemoglobin levels of um, uh, eight or below. And also, uh, do you collect saliva? We collect saliva as well. Okay. And then we collect saliva on, uh, on, for, on the first day, day of admission, as well as uh, on day three and day 10. Okay, and by that time they are COVID negative. Um, yes, yeah, so you know, it, it, it may, may vary depending on the, the person's clinical course, but we, we have the dates of, for example, when their NP swab was taken and so forth. But the, the, the day one is typically, um, we try to recruit them on their admission day, um, day one. And, uh, and then for the, for the outpatient, we only collect once though. So for the outpatient facility, we only have one time collection. Sorry, I'm asking too many questions. And Neil, I had a question for you. Also, the I2B2 program, will that be extended to, uh, say, cancer uh, repository as well, uh, including uh, uh, body fluid and tissue and clinical database? Yeah, so I, I think there's there's two pieces, right? The open specimen and the I2B2. The I2B2 is really uh, an interface to the data warehouse at Keck. And uh, open specimen is kind of going to be the our lab, uh, limb system for the biorepository. Um, so the answer is yes. <laughs> so I don't have an exact timeline for you because obviously COVID is the priority right now. And this is the protocol that we're focusing on. Um, but uh, we've uh, already talked to Karen Lerman uh, at the Cancer Center. Um, and, uh, you know, the plans are obviously to not only migrate the, the protocols that exist into a much more state-of-the-art system, but also for future protocols to live there because compliance, like I said, is obviously getting much more happier with this solution as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, the next question is from uh, Santa Georgia. Um, if you could please unmute yourself and go ahead and ask the question. Hi, I have two questions. Um, for the samples that you're collecting, um, is it possible for us to know the timing of that collection? Like, is it done first thing in the morning at 8 a.m. such that the patient would be something like fasting versus is it randomly done throughout the day? Um, yes, so uh, it is uh, possible to know the timing of collection. Um, the, uh, we have a, um, a collection slip that, that, uh, um, that accompanies each sample that denotes both the uh, date as well as the time. Great, and then my second question is, I did see um, either on the website or on one of your slides, I'm sorry, um, that you do have some tissues, possibly, and I was wondering if the tissues that are part of the biorepository are ever collected at autopsy. Yeah, so I can I can speak to that. So autopsy tissues are um, are um, we haven't gotten a lot of autopsies, um, um, but we ha there are a couple autopsies that were recently done that are COVID positive. And those will probably go to um, the remnant biorepository um, database. So it's a slightly different protocol. Uh, these patients obviously aren't consented as part of the uh, COVID-19 biorepository, but we have a remnant uh, a biorepository database and uh, we are in the process of collecting that. We just, but we don't have a lot of tissue yet. And I'm sorry, do you collect uh, pancreas as part of that autopsy? Um, yeah, I, I don't know about those particular autopsies, but most autopsy protocols include collecting sample uh, tissue types from all organ systems, and that would include pancreas. Thank you. 
Great, uh, thank you. Um, we have a few questions on the Q&A box. Uh, I'm gonna read them out to you. I ask uh, if you um, could please indicate who the question is directed to. Um, that would be uh, really appreciated as well. Uh, so I have a question. We have a question from Sylvia De La Rosa. Um, she says, uh, I understand this project will serve for other future studies, which will have to be approved by the IRB and the biorepository committee. But what is the regulation process for the biorepository? Um, so uh, I'm, I'm interpreting the regulation process as, as uh, what is the overall kind of the, um, the process for, for getting uh, your request approved. Um, so at this current time, we're still working out the, the, some of the details of the request. Um, but essentially, uh, the investigators have to identify uh, first whether they need uh, identified a specimen or de-identified specimen. Um, and uh, depending on those, uh, both requests will probably need some, uh, definitely for the identified specimens, those will need IRB approval. For the de-identified uh, specimens, uh, if you think you may not need IRB approval, you will likely still need to apply for, to the IRB for an exemption. Um, and, uh, um, and then then those requests will then uh, come in along with um, a few other questions that we, we ask of you. Um, it's pretty straightforward, just understanding what is the uh, purpose for which that you will like these samples. Um, and uh, then we have a, hopefully we'll have a, a efficient process for, for evaluating uh, these requests and getting, uh, and getting the response to you. Um, so that's the uh, general overview of, of the process. And, um, but the, in terms of regulatory wise, um, uh, I suspect that some form of IRB uh, approval, whether it's, uh, it's obtaining the exemption status from IRB or uh, an expedited or potentially a full IRB uh, review uh, may be needed for your protocol uh, before we can release the samples. Thank you, Sylvia, are you, um, are you unmuted? Uh, you can go ahead and uh, clarify anything that was, was missed. Hi, thank you. Yeah, thank you for your answer. Um, I was wondering about the actual regulatory process for the biorepository. So do you have to submit the biorepository to, to IRB or do you have any other kind of uh, uh, regulatory agency? Because I I'm guessing you have to consent subjects, right? So what is the process to get your biorepository working? Regular. Oh, I, I see. Um, so you're asking for the biorepository uh, 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 process itself. Yes. So we, yes. Yeah, so we, we have full IRB approval um, for the biorepository. All the patients that are enrolled in the biorepository are prospectively consented. Um, so as they are, uh, as we, uh, and all of our recruitment methods are IRB approved. So we, um, for example, when the patient is um, uh, admitted to the hospital, for example, for COVID, and then we would get alerted to that, and then um, then we would approach the patient to to consent um, uh, for the biorepository. They would then provide consent um, uh, for the procedures that we had talked about. Uh, they have the option also withdraw their consent at any time, um, and um, and so so those are some of some of the pro re some of the regulatory processes. Okay, thank you. Perfect. Um, so the next question is from Allison uh, Chambliss. Um, the question is, uh, will uh, both CAC and county patient data be in the open source system? Yeah, so I can try to answer that. So um, the, the patient particulars that are part of the protocol, um, those will all be uh, in open specimen because they're currently being captured in REDCap. And so, like I said, we have the connectivity from open specimen to red cap, so we'll be able to pull those. What we won't be able to add to that is going to be um, anything additional uh, that's captured from Cerner because uh, county is obviously a separate system than Keck. So as far as the biorepository is concerned, any particulars, uh, any patient reported um, information or demographic or other information that's been captured, that all will be available in open even for county patients. Thank you. 
Um, next question is from uh, Mitchell Gross. Um, can, you, can you speak more about the clinical annotations for the specimens? Is clinical information now manually inputted uh, and curated? Uh, do you plan to eventually integrate data collection directly with Cerner at CAC and LAC? Maybe we can split this question. Um, the annotations captured from the patients, I don't know, April, if you have a better idea, um, but I can speak to um, the connection with Cerner at CAC. We are investigating con connecting, like I said, open specimen with CAC. So some basic particulars, um, uh, like I said, not, uh, not pathology. Uh, we're not exploring pathology um, discrete elements from Cerner as of yet. Uh, but those would be available if you know the patient and you're, you have the IRB uh, to have the MRNs. That's a query you can always make to the data warehouse. You can obviously complete your um, com comprehensive view about that patient with the clinical data needed through the data warehouse. But we will be connecting to Cerner um, with the um, what's called an ADT feed, which is admission, discharge, and transfer, which allows all the patient particulars um, to be part of that. So I guess uh, from the automation side, all I can say is um, there's not going to be that much more clinical data coming directly from Cerner, but if you have a protocol where um, IRB protocol that's approved, where you're allowed to have identified information uh, from not only from the biorepository, but also from the data warehouse, we can then query those patients' clinical data from the data warehouse. And then for the first part of the question, uh, so the part that our team um, uh, is collecting uh, in addition to the demographic information and also is, um, uh, you know, the, the, the date when, the, when we have confirmed um, COVID-19 positivity uh, based on the uh, MP swab samples. Uh, in addition to that, we are also administering uh, two standardized questionnaires uh, one is looking at uh, symptoms, COVID symptoms, and then the other is looking at exposures uh, from the patients with confirmed uh, COVID uh, positivity. And so those would be from both Keck and uh, County or whatever patients are in the repository that will be available across all the patients in the bio repository. Perfect. Um, thank you. Um, so the next question is from... Ming Yuan. Um, the question is, any cost related to utilizing the specimens? Thanks. Great question. Um, uh, so uh, so we, uh, th there is a cost to uh, accessing the biospecimens um, and, um, and this is to uh, cover some, some of the um, costs. It's, it's largely supported by the Keck Foundation, as, I, uh, as we've said, um, but just for the sustainability of the bio repository, um, there, there, is, uh, there are costs associated with it. And the cost is, um, uh, is uh, published in the website that I had uh, referred everyone to. Um, and uh, so if, if you, um, I think in Google, if you type in USC, um, COVID bio repository. Um, uh, the, if you can look, it's, it may not be the top site, but if you look at the first page, it should be um, on there uh, of, the, uh, of the website information. Um, and if anyone needed that address email, uh, that link again, it's um, uh, sc-ctsi.org uh, slash about slash COVID hyphen 19 hyphen file repository. I should, we should create a QR code for this and flash it on the screen right now, but, but, yeah. uh, um, but the, the, the price list is included uh, for the, in that website. And it's on our uh, as a webinar chat window. If you click on the chat uh, feature, it, you have the link to that, uh, uh, to the bio repository website. Thank you, uh, April. Um, next question is um, by Steve K. Uh, do you assist in external slash internal grant applications with boilerplate descriptions of the sample spectrum and informatics infrastructure? Um, so I will comment on that. Um, so on our current website, there is some language there that can be used uh, for uh, grant applications. And uh, 
um, if one scrolls down to the very bottom and uh, you'll see there's a document attached that has uh, a bit more granular description of the file repository. If that is not sufficient, uh, please, uh, please let me know and we can give you additional information that will help with your grant applications. Um, and in addition to that, Dr. Buchanan and I um, uh, are also happy to write letters of support uh, for, uh, for investigators who are submitting grants uh, on this subject area. And I, and I can add to that for the informatics infrastructure. Um, I, I don't think we have a lot of description on the website, but we are developing that. And uh, if there's an early project that we could just co-develop that and put that out there. Is there something that's need to fit into a larger grant that you're doing that kind of follows through how the system works? Uh, we could definitely work with you uh, or with whoever needs that to be able to describe that with the workflow that they're um, proposing in their grant. And sim similarly, um, Mike, or we can also provide a letter of support for your grant application. Perfect. Um, thank you. Um, we have one. Um, one more question uh, by Wei Ming Yuan. Um, he asks, also, how long typically you would take to obtain the specimens in addition to YRB to all or any of you? Like, and, and he means uh, the question is direct to, to any or all of you. <laughs> yeah, so I, I can speak to that. So um, the, um, we're pretty quick. Uh, the, uh, after the IRB approval is, is performed and uh, obtained, either an exemption or, or uh, an approved protocol. Um, as April had mentioned, the process involves uh, reviewing a very short description of what the study is, if it's a research versus a validation um, study. Um, it, can be, it can be pretty quick. I mean, we're very, very mindful that uh, the whole purpose of this biorepository is to make this material available to as many researchers as possible. Um, and so uh, we've already released some specimens, um, but there are a few steps I have to go through. Uh, um, the, the investigators will also need to, to fill out a laboratory agreement um, with uh, Susan McCarthy, who I had mentioned in my presentation, um, but that's pretty fast. Um, the actual process of, of collecting material, finding the material is pretty quick. The process of, of, of connecting it with clinical information is still being developed and hopefully once open specimen is live in the next uh, week or so, it'll be much quicker and Neil can speak to that. But the process of, of, of getting the material released is intended to be as quick as possible. And a lot of this can be run in parallel. So you don't have to get the IRB approval first and then go to the biorepository. You can contact us in the meantime while the IRB is also being contacted and that speeds the uh, process up, of course. Thank you. Um, we have one more question. Um, uh, Steve K is asking, what is the regulatory path if an investigator has completed a study using the COVID-19 biorepository but wants to merge their data with a larger external collaborative group for publication? Um, I, I think I am supposed to take that question, <laughs> and uh, that, that's a great question. I, I was looking at it, and I was uh, fretting it a little bit, Steve, there. Um, so I think partly may have to do with um, uh, identified versus de-identified information. Um, I think with the identified um, uh, information, uh, there, there may be a, a few additional steps, um, uh, especially if that data uh, that information, uh, uh, you know, may potentially be visible to other institutions. So I think for that specific question, we may have to reach back to the IRB for guidance. Okay. Um, thank you very much. I don't think we have any, um, any more questions. Um, so I'd like to thank Dr. Armstrong, Dr. Wallace, and Baroons, Bruce, for very interesting presentations. Thank you for taking the time and speaking uh, to us today. We really appreciate it. And uh, stay tuned for our next virtual series seminar. It's uh, happening soon. Uh, thanks again, everyone, for joining us today. Um, see you soon and goodbye.